We finished with a um, section on moral discipline in this discourse and the next section are four aspects which are necessary as prerequisites for meditation and only then do we get to meditation. So that kind of build-up is extremely common in the Buddha's discourses and it shows and is supposed to show quite clearly the step-by-step development. Now, we mustn't misunderstand and think that we have to be perfect in any of the steps first before we can go to the next one because then we'd never get any further, presumably. But what we do understand from this is that we must practice these steps. And as we know them, we practice them, and we will see from it also that the more we have practiced the preliminary steps, the easier the meditation is. Now, we may have been practicing the preliminary steps without even knowing that they belong to the Buddhist dispensation. It's quite possible that some people practice these things because this is a natural thing for them to do and they will find that their meditation works very well very quickly. The next step is the restraint of the sense faculties. Now, I'll read it out and uh, then I'll explain, okay? And how great king does a person guard the doors of his sense faculties. The doors is where it comes out the senses. Hmm? Here in having seen a form with the eye, one does not grasp at the sign or the details. Since if one were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the eye, evil unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail one. Though one practices restraint, guards the faculty of the eye and achieves restraint over the faculty of the eye. And then the same is said, having heard a sound with the ear, having smelled an odor with the nose, having tasted a flavor with the tongue, having touched a tangible object with the body, Having cognized a mind object with the mind, one does not grasp at the sign or the details. Since if one were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the mind, evil unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail one. One practices restraint, guards the faculty of the mind, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the mind. Endowed with this noble restraint of the sense faculties, one experiences within oneself an unblemished happiness. In this way, the person guards the doors of the sense faculties. Some of the things that will be pertinent to this uh, chapter I have said before, but since also the Buddha repeats himself many times, I have no compunction about repeating myself. In the Buddhist terminology we have not only the five senses which we all know but the thinking is the sixth sense. So we have six senses and it's called the mind faculty. Now the reason that the sense faculties need to be guarded is quite clearly expressed here because if they're not then we either want it or we reject it. We can see it through the eyes, we hear it through the ear, taste it through the um, mouth, smell it through the nose, touch it with the body and think it with the mind. And we do this constantly. This is such a constant activity of a human being that we are not aware. And this is where mindfulness has to step in. We have no idea what we're doing all the time. Only when we become meditators and are 
as our, our um, attention is drawn to this, do we become aware of this fact that this is what we're doing? Now, the restraining is one thing, but first let's have a look how this actually works. It is said like this by the Buddha, that we have the, let's see, the eye base. This is the eye base, right? And it's in good working condition. We're not blind, nor do we have any sickness in the eye. Then we have an eye object, this here, the eye object, right? Now, when the eye base and the eye object come together, eye consciousness arises, which is seen. The eye consciousness is seen. And seeing, as I have already mentioned, we only see color and shape. There's no way we can see woman or man, nor can we see beautiful or ugly. Because if that were so, if we were to see with the eye, beautiful or ugly, then everybody would find everything beautiful equally and everything ugly equally. And it occurred to me many, many years ago that then only one woman and one man could get married because they'd all find the rest of them all ugly. So, <laughs> but that occurred to me many, many years ago, long before I learned about the Buddha. So, the beautiful, ugly, and the uh, all the details are all made up in the mind, every bit of it. Nothing can be seen by the eye ever then the shape and the color. I've already explained that with, this, with the example of this clock. And the same is with the hearing, the same is with the tasting. Now with the tasting it's very clear. Give somebody Indian curry to eat and they think it's wonderful. Give it somebody else to eat and they think it's dreadful. The same food, taste. So, and the touching with the objects that we touch the body with, and of course the thinking pro process. So, it is totally individual how we react to what we see and hear and taste and touch and smell and think. And because we are not aware of what we're doing, and just take it for granted, we do not restrain our sense doors, the eye and the mouth and all the things that are the doors where this consciousness of the senses arises and just blithely go ahead and do whatever seems to be happening at the time. And if you don't restrain it, we will constantly have the mind working on it. And this is that constant thinking process that's going on. Because nobody runs around with their eyes closed, with their ears plugged up, with their nose plugged up, with usually not even with when we want to eat, have to have the, the food. They, we don't protect ourselves from these inputs through the senses. So the mind is constantly reacting to it. And because there's no protection at all for the senses, there's no protection for the mind. And if we don't change that, like we're trying to do in a retreat, we'll never, we can never meditate. There's no way. But if we only change it in a retreat, then the meditation will deteriorate immediately when we get home and our hate and greed will in no way be diminished. It's impossible. There's no way we can diminish the hate and greed unless we have become um, 
at least once returneth when the hate and greed is diminished and it only disappears for a non-returner so if we haven't done that and don't protect our sense doors there's no way we can find a real change in ourselves we can subdue our hate and greed as long as our meditation works very well but that too is then dependent upon being in a retreat in most cases because a time element is missing one doesn't have enough time to do it so we have to bolster our practice of meditation with the restraint of the sense faculties we don't we have two ways of doing that and one way was explained under the section of moral discipline we don't have to watch the television set it's not necessary and we will find out when we learn about clear comprehension which is the next sector that it's actually detrimental to every practice we could ever do so as it was said in the moral discipline unsuitable shows because that excites the senses so that the mind can get a little more excited and it distracts the mind because it gets all these inputs so we can protect ourselves from hearing and seeing unsuitable things I have many times compared that to the kind of food that the mind gets I'm sure that everybody in fact I'm completely convinced that everybody is very keen on eating physical food which is helpful and healthy and strengthening and does not have any poisonous or drugging effect on the body and I'm sure we wouldn't eat anything that's dirty well it's the same thing for the mind exactly only it's more important but most people never think of it everything we see hear taste touch smell and think is food for the mind so if we want to give the mind that which is healthy strengthening which is uh, non-poisonous non-drugging which is um, elevating energy producing we have to watch out what we put in there and we put it in not only through the thinking but through all the senses because we react with our mind with our thinking thought processes to that what is put in through the senses so it's important what we read it's important what we talk it's important what we see what we hear and naturally it's very important what we think but we have already discussed that all of that is a purification practice and that's what this is all about the path of purification the most famous commentary on the Buddha's teaching written in the 5th century by Buddha Gosa a monk in Sri Lanka is called Visuddhi Magga path of purification and it contains in essence the Buddha's teaching with commentarial explanations so purification of mind needs restraint of senses so the first step is not to take in the unwholesome food for the mind and the second step is that which I have already explained as a practice while we're here which is specifically well uh, done in a retreat situation 
but we can of course continue that under all circumstances if we're able which means that we really practice here and try to see something like a leaf or a flower or a tree or a shoe or a bird and see whether we can stop the mind from talking about it seeing only mind you it's very difficult it's not an easy thing to do but even recognizing the fact that it's difficult is already a step in the right direction because we will see how automatic we uh, are in our responses completely automatic responses at least we know that then if we can't stop them at least we know what's going on and the same with sound which is a little easier sound stopping the mind from naming it and reacting to it just sound only again it's not an easy thing to do it's more difficult than other kinds of mindfulness but it certainly is possible and having done it once first of all it feels liberating all of the practices that the buddha has this prescribed are all liberating if they're done every single one of them how liberating is concentration when the mind does not have to think how liberating is loving kindness how liberating is mindfulness every bit of the practice is liberating and in the end is total liberation complete freedom the first thing that happens is that it's liberating that when we are able to stop the mind we just see or just hear it's extremely difficult with tasting but can be done it's not so difficult with smelling a little easier and it's almost impossible with thinking unless we are almost concentrated already then the thought no longer impinges it's just going by so we should try it with seeing and hearing because those are the two senses which are used most mostly and have the greatest impact on us what we see and what we hear and most of the arguments which arise between people is because of what they hear somebody says something and bingo and uh, though the uh, that is a very important one the hearing one and seeing of course is also something that we are constantly engaged in so we should try that and have this liberating effect actually happen to us and the other thing that we also learn from it immediately is that our preconditioned responses need not go on for the rest of our lives we are able to stop them it gives a great deal of self confidence even if we only do it once now if we have done it once we will certainly do it again because it does feel extremely good to do it and it does bolster the confidence that we do not have to be dependent upon the senses for what goes on in our mind now every explanation of meditation that the buddha has given starts out with secluded from the sense contacts if we really want to meditate we can't have sense contacts including thinking and that's when we get can have peacefulness so we have these two abilities we can first of all watch what we put in there and also we can practice this that we hear only sound and see only color and form there is a very good story of the a time of the buddha which illustrates what can be done 
And the story is like this. There was a married couple who had a terrible row. And the wife was disgusted. She didn't want any part of it any longer. So she decided to run away. So she put on all her best saris, one on top of the other, and put all her golden jewelry on, all around, hang it on her ears and around her neck and fingers and bracelets, and ran away. And after about two hours, the husband was sorry and decided to go after her. And so he went after her. But she had already gone ahead quite a distance, so he couldn't find her. And then he met a monk going along the same road. And so he stopped this monk and he said to him, Sir, have you seen a very pretty woman with long black hair having a lot of golden jewelry around her neck and her arms and fingers in a bright red sari come by here? And the monk said, uh, No, but I saw a set of teeth going by. Guarding one's senses. Because otherwise, covetousness and grief will arise. A monk, who was of course enjoined to be celibate, has done that in order not to have any kind of idea in the mind, oh, beautiful woman, maybe I should have got married, not become a monk, <laughs> which happens more often than not. So um, this is a possibility. He guarded his senses so that it wasn't necessary to see the whole beautiful woman with the long black hair and the golden jewelry and the red sari. He just saw a set of teeth going by. Which is right. That's all that went by. Sometimes it's also said that Well, that's good enough with a set of teeth. <laughs> so, which means when we guard our senses that we do not become embroiled in the whole of the thing, but we can actually become aware of parts. Now, that's also part of the clear comprehension expression or explanation that we need not see the signs nor need we see the whole now a signs means beautiful woman and the whole of it is what all of that which makes up the beautiful woman but if you look at one detail you're not going to get completely rapturously impassioned about a set of teeth that's going by. It's not that interesting. So the, um, we can do the same. And we can do it with anything. We can do it with food, for instance. We don't have to imagine, oh, this is a wonderful uh, a piece of uh, chocolate cake. Won't that taste marvelous? And uh, I've always liked chocolate cake, and it's from a good bakery, and all the rest that the mind makes up, just because the eye has seen something black in the shape of a slice, so now the mind knows that this is a piece of chocolate cake, which it has always liked, and which is from a good bakery, and which will probably taste marvelous, and which one should get, and after having had one, one should have two. But... Seeing it there, one can also recognize the fact that it's just made from flour and sugar and some chocolate on it. So one sees the bits and pieces and not the whole. 
And if we see the bits and pieces, it's not going to be so enticing. And we don't have to have the mind go over it, how wonderful it would be. The same applies to all other things that we see and hear and taste, touch, smell and think. With the thinking process, which is explained here, I'll, um, having cognized a mind object with the mind. Now, the mind, we can say that like that, the mind is the thinking base. And the idea is the mind object. So the cognition which starts in the mind is our thinking. Just like the eye's cognition of this eye object is the seeing, so the mind's cognition of the mind object is our thinking. And all the thinking that we do, we don't have to believe it. Now whatever it is that we're thinking, if it leads us towards wanting or rejecting, disliking, resisting, fearing, or passionately wanting to have, all of that, we don't have to believe any of it. We can see every blip of the thought. And if we see every blip of the thought, which comes and goes and comes and goes, we're not going to get enraptured by these thoughts of what we want and the thoughts of what we hate. So we have this practice opportunity for seeing things in their detailed manifestation rather than in the whole. And if you remember the set of teeth instead of the beautiful woman, you'll know what that's all about. All, all senses can be used in the same way, in the same way. It says here that if one does the noble restraint of the sense faculty, one has an unblemished happiness within. That's that liberation that I was talking about. One feels free of the oppression. It, if one practices that, one has an immediate recognition of oppression. The oppression is totally self-produced. Nobody oppresses us. But it is produced because our senses, which are constantly at work, are producing in the mind the wanting and the disliking. And that's an oppression because it creates a feeling of first of all anxiety and it also creates a feeling of unrest if I want something I've got to do something about it or I've got to keep on wanting it in the mind and if I want to get rid of something I've also got to do something about it so there's no peace ever the, the uh, guarding of the sense faculties brings that liberation feeling which is this unblemished happiness It is a very good opportunity to practice this here because there's much less going on here than there usually is in one's daily life. And as we practice that, we get a much closer insight into ourselves. See that the um, senses that we use constantly are meant to be used so that we can stay alive. They are, used, they are to be used for that. If we are blind or deaf, it's m or can't think. I mean, that would be even worse. But even those, it's very difficult. Life is extremely difficult. But we don't re recognize the fact 
that we have to use them for staying alive. We are always concerned with having them for our pleasure. They're supposed to be the uh, um, pleasure dome in which we can then enjoy ourselves. But that's not what they're meant for all. We will have, from the sense contact, pleasant feelings and unpleasant feelings and neutral feelings. That's all there is, those three. But if we then don't make any big deal about it, but just stick to that and don't start explaining the whole business, that's all. Because the feeling arises and ceases. That's all it can do. There's nothing else it can do. It comes and it goes. And it goes immediately because the sense contact is very quick our sense contacts are very limited in time they have to be if they weren't they become outright dukkha imagine that you're feeling very cold so you like to take a hot bath so you go and have a hot bath and then you say to your friend Oh, it's marvelous, this hot, hot bath. I really like it in here, in the hot bath tub. So the friend says, well, you know, nobody else wants it. You can stay there another five or six hours. Well, it's not pleasurable anymore. It's awful. And the same is if you eat something very nice. And uh, it tastes very good. And so you tell the cook, lovely, really like the meal. And then the cook says, look, we've got that many left over. Why don't you stay another hour or two and eat some more? <coughs> Horrible, isn't it? Maximum half an hour. Maximum. It's that long. In fact, I wrote in my book, Maximum 20 Minutes, and the editor said, no, 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 half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> True. So I said, okay, half an hour. <laughs> I'll never eat for half an hour. <laughs> so anyway, if it takes any longer, it becomes misery, utter misery. And now with our seeing, with the eye, there's a self-protection there. The eye blinks all the time. We can never stick to anything without blinking. It's impossible. But even if we don't notice that, which we don't, and look at a painting, well, how long can you stick, stay there and look at the same painting? Just imagine. Somebody tells you to stay there all day and look at that painting. Uh, go nuts. Impossible. Can't be done. And the same is with sound. Play the most wonderful classical music. One hour? Okay. Two hours? Okay. But Twelve hours? That's already misery. Or you have to shut off, have to cut it out, can't listen to it any longer, because the mind can't take it in anymore. So it's got to be short-lived. It's not just that it is short-lived, it has to be short-lived. Now, having to be short-lived, that means arising and ceasing and disappearing again, if this is all that we can get out of life, that includes thinking, that's not very much, is it? Because we've got to st constantly have to run and renew it, the nice things. Now, because we won't always be able to renew the nice parts, we're always going to be in a sort of a quandary. How am I going to get this nice sense contact back? And we'll have to spend our energy and our time to do that. So it's... Um, a kind of activity that the whole of humanity is engaged in. And without noticing it, that one can stop it, one won't be able to. And in some instances, this sense contact that we're looking for can become an addiction. And if it becomes an addiction rather than a preference, then we're really in trouble. We all know what it's like, even if we may not have experienced it ourselves, but addictions are real trouble. And most people's preferences are very close to addictions. 
They can't live without this or that and may it be ever so innocent. They have to have this or that in the morning or at noon or in the evening. So the preferences very often are almost addictions already because when then there is a change of place, they have to go somewhere else, they have to travel, they can't do it because they can't get what they usually get through the senses. They can't get the same food, they can't get the same bed, they can't, there's a lot of things that will become then unpleasant. So when the preference has become an addiction, watch out, then there's trouble. Because then we're stuck. What we are addicted to, we are hanging on to. We're so attached to it that we can't get away from it. And then, of course, if we can't get away from one thing, then we can't go anywhere else. This is another aspect of restraining our senses. Once we've let them roam and let them do what they like, to then say no to oneself and say, no, I'm not going to have this beautiful piece of chocolate cake, that is already more like punishment. And uh, it's not very nice to punish oneself. It's much better to gain insight. And the insight comes from the fact that one doesn't see the whole thing, but sees the details of it, the bits and pieces. And then it's no longer so enticing and attractive. So the, um, that aspect of it, that we are, everybody has preferences. There's nothing wrong with that. But to watch out that they're not addictions and to realize that to punish oneself by not having what looks so wonderful and by not uh, enjoying that, that's not the way. The way is to know that that too is not going to be fulfilling. Whatever it may be, that too is not going to give me what I'm actually looking for. Anybody who goes for meditation has become aware of the inner yearning for fulfillment and peace. And fulfillment and peace can never come through the senses, which includes thinking. It's not possible. So we need to experience that in ourselves. It's all very logical and very rational, but it has to be experienced. Only when we experience it, then we know it. And that's why it's very important to do that while we're here. Before I go to the next uh, chapter, or next um, section, I should say. It's not a chapter, it's a section, which is mindfulness and clear comprehension. I'd rather have you find out if you have any questions on this one, because it's going to be too confusing to have two uh, sections and then the questions. Better see first about the sense faculties and their restraint, or whether everything is utterly clear Perfectly, yes. Um, I've tried at times, say, when I look at a beautiful woman, to, to see her as old as a skeleton, things like that. And I can do that, but my immediate reaction is, but right now she's very beautiful, and go back and see, and see her as, as a beautiful woman. Mm. Um, it's like my mind knows that there's other ways to deal with these things, to try and see set of teeth. But there's another part of it that says, yeah, but right now, and grab mm. if you have any... Sure. Um, again and again and again. It's a skill like any other. And all skills need to be practiced. So next time you see a beautiful woman, look at the set of teeth and see whether that works, right? Or maybe she has big feet or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anything, anything at all. You see, that comes down to the um, seeing the unlovely in the lovely. I have spoken about that, the five noble powers, right? right. 
and um, which also means that one sees the impermanent aspect and the non-fulfilling aspect. So the um, uh, seeing the unlovely and the lovely in this case. You know. And if one does it often enough, it finally sinks in. It really does. Because the mind is habitually programmed. And what you need to do is just reprogram it. And because it has been programmed for such a long, long time already, there are, there are so many details that have been programmed in, it takes a while to take that all out and put the new program in. So that should be something that you could relate to, no? <laughs> <laughs> so try and... and try it with that, uh, you know, feet or anything like that. Yeah, the detail, seeing the detail. Or with the other way, which you have also tried already, which is seeing color, shape, and not beautiful woman. But in daily life, it's almost impossible. It's too quick. But what you can do is, after you've seen already beautiful woman, go back and just see color and shape and see if you can do it on the second try. You can try that. You know, it's, uh, it's worth a try. I mean, unless we really make up our minds to do this one, just to see without explaining, um, it doesn't happen. Because these four parts of mind are so connected that they always come so quickly. Anything else? Yes. If you see a beautiful painting in a museum, which you know you can't, you, you admire it, but you know you can't have it because it's, you'll get into trouble. <laughs> if you steal but it. If you steal it, yeah. yeah. Um, like the Mona Lisa, although it's been stolen, stolen a few times. Isn't there, I'm trying to think about being able to admire something, but it not go into, I have to have it. I mean, because yeah. there's beautiful art, and if you, I mean, there's something about admiring art. Yeah, well, in, in this, well, in this case, you are already prevented from wanting to have it because you know you can't. So, I mean, it's not a great, uh, uh, very great uh, discipline not to want it. You know, I mean, if you were a multi, multi, multi millionaire, you might think, hmm, wonder how much they want for this. You know, but since you don't have that kind of money, I presume, I don't know, but I presume <laughs> <laughs> you don't even think that because it's pre you're preventing, it's prevented. So it's not a discipline at all. You know, so the, the admiration of something beautiful is all right. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's not going to get us onto another plane of, uh, of consciousness. I mean, anybody can do it, right? Anybody can admire something beautiful. We don't have to be extremely spiritual about that. But uh, to be on another, play, another level of consciousness, one has to do other things. And uh, with a painting, actually, it's one of the easiest things in the world, especially if it's abstract. That is one of the <laughs> easiest things in the world, just to see color and form. Because it doesn't tell you anything, at least it doesn't tell me anything. So all you see is the color and the shape. And you can p protect the mind from even saying painting. And that's a, such a, a freeing moment because then the most freeing part of it is the, is the fact that you know you can stand back and not go into this whole explanation of the mind when you want to. In other words, you're getting more and more in charge of the mind rather than that the mind's in charge of you. So, I mean, admiring a beautiful painting is nothing particularly wrong with it. And this is the trouble with greed. There doesn't seem to be anything particularly wrong with it. What's wrong with eating a piece of chocolate cake? Is there anything wrong with it? I mean, not as, uh, nothing in particular, is there? So, because of that, there's something wrong with hate all the time. People don't like people that other people are very hateful and they don't talk nice and all that. But with greed, it seems to be perfectly okay, you know? <laughs> but it's just exactly the same as hate, only the other way, you know? So, 
that's why we need to see ourselves in more detail in more you know an analysis is that clear anything else okay Well, this is going to be a very long and um, detailed and elaborate explanation because as I have already mentioned to you before, I did explain clear comprehension in a very simple way. But there is far more to clear comprehension than what I have said so far. It is part of the meditative And practically all of them lead all the way to complete liberation. We have aspects of the teaching which are much more, much deeper going and far more incisive than the ordinary everyday kind of teaching which is also purification but does not have that depth of seeing things in a totally different way. So the next sector, I'll just start on it because I won't be able to finish it. It's called Mindfulness and Clear Comprehension. And Mindfulness and Clear Comprehension are very often spoken about by the Buddha in conjunction with each other. And that is quite clearly uh, understood because mindfulness is bare attention without any judgment. Mindfulness is knowing only. The first time I heard about mindfulness, the monk who was explaining that, a Thai monk, was saying knowing only. And because this English wasn't so very clear, I couldn't understand what it meant. I thought, what is this knowing only, knowing only, knowing only? What can that be? But it's quite clear, isn't it? It's knowing only. It has no judgment in it, no explanation. It's just being there. And clear comprehension is the one that understands what's going on. So the two have to work in conjunction. Because if they don't, we could use mindfulness on, tot on things which we do which may not be wholesome at all. Because we can be mindful on whatever it is that we like to do. Now, I'll, I'll read it out what it says. It's very short. And how great king is a person endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension? Herein, in going forward and returning, one acts with clear comprehension. In looking ahead and looking aside, one acts with clear comprehension. In bending and stretching the limbs, one acts with clear comprehension. In wearing robes and cloak and using arms bowl, one acts with clear comprehension. In eating, drinking, chewing and tasting, one acts with clear comprehension. In defecating and urinating, one acts with clear comprehension. In going, standing, sitting, lying down, waking up, speaking and remaining silent, one acts with clear comprehension. In this way, one is endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension. It's a very short uh, sector and it entails an enormously long uh, and um, important teaching without which there is no way that one can practice anything. There's no way we can practice without mindfulness and clear comprehension. So I think I would like to do that tomorrow because it's uh, the uh, it just started and
drop it right away because it um, has an enormous lot in it. Particularly the clear comprehension. The, um, the mindfulness I have already described because I felt that it should be described earlier so that it can be practiced. So maybe I'll just repeat because I find this inc incredibly important and I repeat it again tomorrow the four foundations of mindfulness so that everybody will remember without any difficulty I hope the four possibilities of being mindful and the first one is the body which I told you already the Buddha said it is of the utmost importance meaning its movements and its actions some of them autonomous most of them volitional and that is part of daily life of course but it has to be in a retreat a practice which we do as constant as possible watching one's body movements watching one's actions now for instance if somebody is called upon to cook cooking is a lot of body actions and movements a wonderful opportunity for being mindful not thinking I wonder whether they're gonna like it not thinking I wonder if this is enough not thinking why do I always have to cook I don't really like cooking not thinking I w why don't they have in big enough pots or small enough pots or square pots or round pots but just doing what is necessary with the body not thinking all those extraneous thoughts knowing when chopping a carrot knowing when tearing a lettuce knowing when turning on the gas and nothing else or electricity I don't know what it is knowing when the body is doing it not thinking that oh this should be tasting like that and that should be like this and I'm going to have it this way and I'm going to have it that way and I can cook better better than the one that cooked yesterday or uh, <laughs> or maybe I can't cook so well because I don't have the practice or uh, cooking and meditation don't go together these are all extraneous thoughts which have no basis in fact they are personal opinions and personal opinions are detrimental to seeing the truth but mindfulness is the only way we'll ever get at the truth there is no other way the one way for the purification of beings for the overcoming of pain, grief and lamentation for the final elimination of all dukkha for entering the noble path for realizing total liberation is mindfulness these are the Buddha's words which are quoted over and over again and most people who have been in meditation retreats know them have heard them have been told them and forget them promptly washing dishes while washing dishes not thinking oh so many pots and why do they have to eat so much and there are so many plates again and why can't they use paper plates I don't have to wash dishes and why don't they have somebody who washes dishes here and we can pay them a little bit or something like that <laughs> washing dishes while washing dishes <laughs> becoming aware of the movement of the hand that's all becoming aware of the movement of the feet when they have to go somewhere to get something then the hand again that's all that's all that's necessary and that purifies 
and not only does it purify because there's no problem then of course and no resistance and no rejection and no greed and no aversion but it does more than that it quietens the mind down so that when, when the one sits down again to meditate it's already quiet we only have the one mind filled with all sorts of stuff but it's the same mind that stands in the kitchen thinking about all these extraneous things and it's the same mind that sits here and thinks about the extraneous things it, there's no difference between that so here it can think about what it's going to do tomorrow and in the kitchen it can think about all the things it uh, uh, hopes and wants and doesn't want mindfulness in physical action is the one thing in daily life which will change daily life there's nothing to worry about when we're mindful we can't be mindful and worry we can't be mindful and be fearful at the same time we can't be mindful and having a passionate wanting or passionate aversion it's impossible either we're mindful or we're doing any of those other things so practicing mindfulness on the body which is the first foundation and as the Buddha said without that we're not going to reach Nibbana get freedom is particularly useful when one has a job to do because then one can see quite clearly that one's not doing it because one has all sorts of opinions about the job one opinion after another instead of being mindful then we have of course the opportunity to be mindful when we as it's mentioned here bending and stretching the limbs wearing the clothes the robes eating drinking chewing tasting defecating urinating going standing sitting lying down waking up speaking remaining silent all to be used with mindfulness every bit of it sweeping uh, picking things up from the floor sitting down on a chair everything has a movement an action and mindfulness of that is our way to peacefulness in daily life removing personal opinions from our standard repertoire with which we are constantly playing this theater here and having the ability to change from the meditative process to the necessary daily action and back again without any interruption if we can only be meditators if we are only sitting our legs are going to atrophy we're going to be in a total mess so we'll have to be able to do both and not have so much difficulty now obviously these are ideal situations I'm describing and there is always some difficulty but this is what we're learning we're here to learn we're called savakas learners only the Arahant, the fully enlightened one, is no longer a learner. He's done it. He doesn't have to learn anything. He can, well, usually they do more than other people. But um, other, other than that, we are here to learn it. And it is such an opportunity to learn as much of that, of that mindfulness, of the action, while we're here. Because in daily life, it's difficult to learn then we have to bring with us what we have already learned and if we bring that skill with us we will find that life is much smoother much more harmonious much more peaceful so simple nobody does it it's much smoother because we don't interrupt the action by our opinions 
It's not getting interrupted. And the, uh, the peacefulness is, of course, because we don't get into problems. And the harmony comes from the fact that things are done without any great difficulty. Whatever needs to be done gets done. And there's no idea of how much I have to do and how I'm overworked and how I don't really like doing that and how couldn't somebody else do it and uh, none of that. These are all personal opinions. And they are constantly, of course, um, disturbing peacefulness and they're also disturbing efficiency. The, uh, the smooth running of one's life depends upon moment-to-moment moment awareness. I'm sure everybody has used or read or heard those words. What does it mean? Mindfulness, that's it, nothing else. Moment-to-moment. Moment. With that also comes the final uh, understanding of the fact that there is only this moment. If there was anything else in life to be found other than this moment, then we would have found it by now. There is nothing. There are memories and there are plans. The plans never come out exactly as we plan them and the memories are all convoluted anyway. The actual thing, the only thing that happens is this one moment. And if we live in this one moment, then we live. Everything else is conjecture. This one moment is the only one we've got. And it's already gone. And if we don't have mindfulness, we'll never catch it. It's always going to be gone. So the mindfulness has been so praised and advocated by the Buddha and so mentioned in so many ways and forms that I must um, give it its due. And uh, I'll talk about the other three foundations tomorrow and the clear comprehension. The clear comprehension which is such an important part of the teaching. Okay? Any questions on mindfulness? Hmm? Everything quite clear, it seems, or quite muddled, whatever. It's quite clear, is it? No questions. Wonderful. All going to be. Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. And on the next in-breath, breathe in peace and fill yourself with it. Breathe it in from wherever you think it can come to you or help you from the sky, the moon, the stars, the air around you the trees, the sun, breathe it into you and fill yourself from head to toe with peace. A feeling of evenness solid feeling feeling of being at ease
breathe it in with every breath you take. And on your next outbreath, breathe out love and surround yourself with it. Love that comes from your heart feels warm and embracing, caring. and nurturing. Breathe in peace and fill yourself with it. Breathe out love and surround yourself with it. Put your attention on the person nearest you in this room and breathe out love and peace to that person. Fill him or her with peace. Surround and embrace him and her with love. And now breathe out love and peace to everyone here. Fill everyone with peace. Embrace everyone with love. Peace which is untroubled. at ease, smooth, love which is warm, caring and nurturing. Now think of your parents. Breathe out love and peace to them. Fill them with peace. Surround them with love. Give them the best you carry within you.
think of those people who are nearest and dearest to you with whom you might be living fill them with peace surround them with love let them feel what peace and love are like Think of all your good friends. Breathe out peace and love to them, filling them with peacefulness. Giving them your friendship with that, embracing them with your love. Recognizing your togetherness. Think of everyone who is part of your life. Fill everyone with peace from head to toe. Embrace everyone with love. Let each one have the most valuable gift you can give them. Think of anyone you might have difficulties with or towards whom you feel quite indifferent. Breathe out love and peace to that person too, filling him or her with the well-being and the ease of peacefulness and embracing him or her with love. which means being together. Closely together, heart to heart. And now breathe out love and peace 
and let it float to people near and far. Coming to them like the air that surrounds each one, that fills each one's lungs. In that way, you breathe out love and peace to them. Anyone you can think of, anyone you can imagine, whoever it may be, wherever they may be. Let them take in love and peace with each breath they make as you breathe it out to them. Put your attention back on yourself. Feel filled with peace from head to toe. No fear, no worries. Smooth, calm, at ease. On each in breath, fill yourself with peace. On each out breath, surround yourself with love. Feeling cared for and protected. And happy.
may all beings experience loving peace.